Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining and uh, welcome to this new episode of our Lunch and Learn series, uh, which is organized by uh, La French Tech Indonesia. Um, for those who do not know us, uh, La French Tech is a global network with uh, over 60 communities in more than 50 countries around the world. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization which is exclusively run by a team of volunteers. Uh, our community in Indonesia started two years ago, uh, and we are now a group of over 200 entrepreneurs, investors, and tech aficionados of any sort. Um, our objective really uh, with uh, La French Tech in Indonesia is to build um, an inclusive community uh, in order to contribute to uh, building a strong tech ecosystem um, in Indonesia. So it is not a French uh, community for French people, but really for anybody who has some interest in, uh, in tech uh, of any sort. Um, so we are running a number of different initiatives to engage and communicate with, uh, with our community. Uh, you can meet with us uh, on a monthly basis. We organize uh, networking events uh, in Jakarta and in Bali. We also have podcasts. Uh, we had an annual uh, summit two weeks ago and so many more. Uh, so if you are not yet part of uh, our group, uh, you can join us. Just go to frenchtech.id. I will add uh, the uh, link on the comment. Uh, just join us and, and, and uh, join the fun. Okay. So now, without further ado, uh, let's go to what brings us here today, um, which is to get to know about crypto. So I would like to welcome Florian uh, for our episode 12 of season two for the Lunch and Learn. So just um, to give a little bit of background about, uh, about Florian. So Florian uh, spent 15 years building purpose-driven startups and he gathered experience in various C-level roles in marketing, business and operations. Uh, he's currently CEO at Port portkey.finance, uh, which is a social recovery wallet. Uh, he was previously a CMO at Card Anos, a commercial and venture arm, and he was the first foreign hire by Chinese unicorn Mobike, uh, where he, impl uh, he planned and executed the international expansion strategy until reaching uh, the uh, $3.8 billion IPO in 2018. Um, he's also an advisor and mentor in Web3 Startups, and he is a uh, Startup Grind Director in Bali. All this is Florian. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Florian. Um, nothing more to say, over to you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, and what, what an amazing introduction. I wouldn't have said better myself. <laughs> um, yeah, very happy to be here. Uh, it's the first time for me to do this format, so it's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, before I start, can I just go around the group and ask, like on a scale from one to five, how would you rate your crypto knowledge? Uh, can we go around the room and just get a number from one to five, five being most knowledgeable and one being least knowledgeable? Where would you put yourselves? I would say 3.5. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I would say like three. Okay. I'm a one. I'm a clear one. one 1.5 1. perhaps. Okay. <laughs> and some amount of knowledge. Uh, so, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. If it's too complicated, please stop me. Um, if it's too simple, please tell me. Don't take anything I'll say too seriously. Uh, this is meant to be fun, uh, to be shared over lunch. And also a lot of this are my personal views after being in the space since 2016. Uh, few of the things that I'll talk about are really set in stone or are admitted as universal truth. When I do talk about universal truth, like I'll try to make it very clear, but generally speaking, this, this is gonna be a light and entertaining presentation, hopefully. So take everything with a grain of salt. And just like with anything in the world of crypto, do your own research. So whether it's me, whether it's your family member, whether it's anybody, do your own research. Try to learn as much as you can. Even if it's complicated, start somewhere. Do your own research. That's the, the If you remember only one thing from the entire presentation, remember that. 
so I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, why I'm here. I'll try to get you excited after that about crypto. So I'll talk about why some people love it. Uh, I'll try to give a definition uh, what the F is crypto, because at the end of the day, we kind of need to define it uh, if we want to talk about it. Then I'll have a look at the other side of the balance, like why do some people hate it and why is there a lot of uh, still to this day bad talk about it. I'll do a little shameless plug because I do work for a, a social recovery wallet, which is called Portkey, uh, as mentioned previously. And I'll use that to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, and then if you want to take it further, I got like two or three recommendations of books slash podcast of people that you can uh, follow. So it looks like a lot, but uh, each slide is pretty short. So I hope it'll be fun. Um, so this is how I feel on the left parts of the image, like people from the 2017 bull run. This is how I feel. Uh, let me tell you why I feel like this. Uh, this is me working, very happily working away uh, late 2016. At the time, I was working in a very exciting uh, company, a Chinese company, the unicorn actually, that Mobike, uh, Mobike that Anne just mentioned. So I was working happily in, in Mobike, which was a huge company, but it was also a very Web2 company. At the time, I had never heard of Bitcoin. I had never heard of blockchain. I was a newbie. And one day, a friend came up to me. He was extremely excited, and he said, do you have your MetaMask? Are you ready for what's coming? And again, I remind you, this was end 2016, early 2017. And when my friend came up to me, he was obviously very excited and he was onto something. And I said, no, what's a MetaMask? I had no idea, I had never heard of it. So I went online, I, I tried to download the MetaMask and I couldn't, I wasn't able to. Not, I, not that I wasn't able to download the wallets, but I wasn't able to digest the information. It was asking me to store a seed phrase. I was like, what's what's a seed? Why do I need this? Why like, I don't just log in with my Google account or whatever? Like it left me very confused and very puzzled. So that was my face at the time. And ultimately the moral of this story is that I first heard about it at that time, but I didn't join the bandwagon and I didn't get my MetaMask and I missed out on the upward movements that we saw in the 2017 bull run. So, you know, eight years later, I'm here and I'm happy and it's okay. But lesson number one that I often think back to is, you know, never stop learning. And it's whether you like crypto or whether you hate it or whether you're in the middle, there's one thing that is a universal truth, I believe, is that the space moves so fast, there's always something to learn. So even if it looks scary or complicated, if you do the efforts of learning, then you can be handsomely rewarded. Uh, so that's how I got here. And since then, uh, I'm happy to say that I have a MetaMask. I have a crypto wallet. We even did some custom hardware wallets on the right with my previous uh, project. In 2021, I created a, a consulting firm specialized in marketing and communications. We've worked with some of the biggest projects in the space. Some of them are here on the slide, uh, specifically around how to define the target audience and how to craft your narrative and how to implement your marketing strategy. Um, and now I'll try to get you excited for the future. So let's look at why some people love crypto first. So maybe some of you have kids, I don't yet, uh, but I'm still a kid. So when you look at the gaming landscape today, the traditional gaming landscape, there are some obvious issues, notably with regards to monetization. Uh, the big companies are centralized. The big game developers are centralized. They push out AAA games, AA games. And a lot of people and a lot of communities are very upset with the monetization methods. You might have heard about battle passes that I'm showing here on screen, you know, the Fortnite battle pass. Basically, you have to pay to access additional content. You have to pay to win. This is a now almost ubiquitous mechanization, uh, monetization model that is very poorly received by a lot of communities and a lot of people. Uh, the screenshot on the right, uh, obviously, you know, Dota 2 is a very, very popular uh, game, also played competitively. Their battle pass made a huge amount of money for the developer, but what good did it actually do for the game, right? Like, there are a lot of complaints and a lot of issues in the traditional, in the current gaming industry, uh, especially specifically around monetization. 
And I'm going to talk about gaming mostly because that's where I have the most interest and the most knowledge. So most of my examples will be focused on gaming. But this same kind of thinking can be applied to supply chain, uh, owner, uh, IP rights, uh, uh, many different industries, the medical sector, the financial sector, many different industries. Uh, the monetization of the current games and the whole discussion around loot boxes, so the pay to win uh, situation, has gotten a lot of attention also from governments and from various uh, legislative bodies in various countries. Austrian court rules that FIFA loot boxes violate gambling laws. So the, the games and the way they monetize come dangerously close sometimes, if not often, to gambling. And then it's a whole different set of regulations, right? Um, the House of Lords in the UK for many, many years has been looking at, you know, are these loot boxes, are these monetization models considered gambling? So there is this discussion that is ongoing. That's the current state of the gaming industry. What you also see because it's centralized is the fact that the game developer or the publisher has kind of godlike rights and abilities. Because it's centralized, if they want to delete an account for XYZ reason, they can do it. So this poor user on the left, this is on the left, you see my account has been deleted. This is a thread on a forum. It's a World of Warcraft forum. And without, into, without getting into the details of why this person got their account deleted, the fact of the matter is that it was deleted by a central entity. Maybe this person spent five years, 10 years into the game. Maybe they bought a certain number of equipment. Maybe they poured $1,000, $10,000 into the game. Every month they pay their subscription. And then for an arbitrary reason, everything is taken away from them and there's no recourse possible and everything is gone instantly because it's centralized. Similarly, on the right, maybe you're less familiar with World of Warcraft, but I'm sure you're familiar with Twitter. There are multiple reports of people who used to own specific accounts. And one bright morning, their accounts were gone. At music was taken away. At X was taken away. And again, there is no recourse possible um, in this case. So through those first three slides, I want to give some kind of examples and highlight some of the problems that we have with the current states of the large corporations and the current states of the internet. Because web one, we'll see, we'll see why specifically ownership is a key word here. Because web one was very much read, the read stage. Uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we can see the logos here that we know, the Skype, the Flickr, the Google. It was very much about accessing information online and right? you think of the library that goes online you access information you read information that was very much the first wave of the internet the second wave we can say was much more read and write of course now i can read all of the information but it's about user generated content and it's about uploading my content it's about writing to the various social platforms and here we see same same kind of logos that we're very familiar with. And all of these platforms are content content driven and user generated content driven. I think so far everybody you know, understands this pretty straightforward. Read first, read and write. Where crypto and blockchain come in is read, write, and earn. Actually, I think there's a better word for this. Think own. So going back to my previous examples, in a world where blockchain is embedded in the games, you can actually own your assets. Going back to the example of the player who plays World of Warcraft for 10 years, has massive investments in time and money into the game. Well, currently they don't own anything. If blockchain was embedded in the game, they would actually have ownership of their assets they would actually be able to trade these assets on secondary markets. If the features are implemented, they could be able to port these assets over to another game from the same publisher or from a different publisher. But all of those things are enabled in games by blockchain when it's implemented. So I think one way 
without diving into the technical aspect of blockchain at all, right? One way to look at it is this, this three kind of three step, read first, read and write, and then read, write and own. I think a lot of the discussion in blockchain and crypto revolves around the rights of ownership and taking back from the large corporations, the GAFAs, taking back our ownership rights. I think that is a fundamental, fundamental characteristic of blockchain. And it's one of the reasons why some people love it, because it's, it's very exciting to know that you have more freedom, more rights, including ownership rights. So I'm very, if you can't tell, I'm very passionate about <laughs> this definition. Um, I mentioned World of Warcraft. Uh, I want to give you, so now the, the next few slides, I want to give you like more tangible examples of what I mean in terms of ownership, to put some images and to put something more tangible in our, in our, before our eyes and in our brains. So World of Warcraft, many consider to be like the first metaverse. Today, we hear a lot about metaverse. Everybody's like, what's the metaverse? Is it a scam? Well, it kind of existed 25 years ago already. World of Warcraft, massive online game with inhabitants, with quests, stuff to do, people organizing themselves in societies and guilds. So there's a very social component to such games. You can trade items, characters, mounts, all of this trade amongst the millions of players creates actual economies. Like all of this is stuff that exists for the past 15 years. And it's actually very tangible. Like it is not a joke to say that there is a real economy in World of Warcraft or other games for that matter. It is actually very advanced and it, it works. Um, these communities organize themselves, these people and communities organize themselves in the game, but that also permeates into real life. So you have conventions, you engage with other people outside of the metaverse, outside of the game. And it even had a pandemic. So, I think it was the, the the bad blood event or something. I mean, it wasn't an event. What happened is that a bug happened in the game. The game had a bug which created a status for the players which would slowly drain their health over time. So it, it was a bug in the system, but then it translated into a pandemic because one day people log in the system and everybody's health is slowly decreasing. A lot of people lose their life. Some people, by definition, are healers in the game. So they're able to heal themselves. They're able to heal others. Um, and there's a Wikipedia, Wikipedia page about it. I find it fascinating. Like, go and, and, and look it up. Um, and I'm just mentioning this example to highlight how real and how tangible virtual wor worlds can be. So that was 15 to 20 years ago. Today, it's about Minecraft. Uh, which is the best-selling video game of all time. Um, so again, if you have kids that play it, maybe you're familiar. If you're not familiar, the fact that it's the best-selling game of all time is probably something that makes it relevant to look at. It's also community-based. The community will create their own worlds, and it's completely limitless. It's just limited by the number of players and their imagination. And most importantly, it's a platform where people connect. It's got a very social a very strong social mechanism. It's also got its own economies, its own quests, its own societies. And so I'm giving, giving these examples again to contrast the web two and the web three because in World of Warcraft, all of these things existed, but again, centralized on the developer servers. With Minecraft, the future of Minecraft, blockchain being embedded in Minecraft-like games, then that becomes something you can own. You can actually, I believe, if not today, that very soon in the future, you're going to be able to have a job, which is creating Minecraft worlds. You get paid on the blockchain. Everything is transparent and it's going to be a job. Like people are going to create virtual worlds and they'll be able to monetize that through blockchain technology and directly with the user, directly with the consumer, no more middlemen. So the next three slides I think are very beautiful. Um, this is the beginning of Minecraft. And I talk a lot about Minecraft again because it's a great gaming example. And I feel like it's the perfect game in between Web 2 and Web 3 to give 
examples and really to put images in your mind. So this is the start of Minecraft. It's pretty basic. You've got cubes. Some cubes are wood. Some cubes are earth. Some cubes are water. Um, and that's basically how you start. However, given the unlimited creativity of the community, you end up building mega cities like this one, for example. Um, and this is just quote unquote, again, this is just a world. This is one person or a few people who built this and it's amazing. This is another creation. They recreated uh, Starry Night uh, from Van Gogh and they, they built something around it and when i look at this i'm like wow you know and again going back to the metaverse a lot of people talk about the metaverse um and maybe you've heard of like a museum in the metaverse right and i think that gets a lot of people confused like why would i pay to put vr goggles on and go into a museum to watch nfts but when i see this i get it like i would pay to walk in this world just like you would in a museum and you spend however long you want in that world and then you switch to the next room and the next room might be uh, something like this is something I mean you, you can walk from room to room and jump from creation to creation again if all of that is blockchain enabled then the artist can have royalty fees can be rewarded uh, visitors can be incentivized it makes everything transparent and trackable so by the way, this one is less pretty than the previous one. Can anybody guess what this is actually? It's a game. game. It's a, so this is still Minecraft, right? Um, it, this is in Minecraft. Can can then can you guess what it is inside Minecraft? Paris. Ah. Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a Tetris. Tetris. It's a replicate of Tetris, and okay. in order to play Tetris, you need some kind of a computer. So what you see on the right is a computer. So inside Minecraft, you have electricity. I mentioned in the beginning, you have blocks of earth, water, rock, sand, whatever. Well, you have a property or a block, you have something that is called electricity. If you combine it with rock and metal, you can create transistors. So you can let electricity flow left or right, like a LED or transistor. And if you have enough time, passion, knowledge, experience, you can build this, which is actually a computer that runs Tetris inside of Minecraft. And if you can't tell, like this is mind blowing to me. Uh, and this is not necessarily new, like people know, people in the Minecraft community and everything like know this, this exists, right? Um, so again, giving like some artistic examples, some technical example about all the potential of community-based, self-governed, transparent, platforms like this is the kind of scale this is the kind of potential that we're looking at which i think is very very exciting uh, i don't own uh, anything sandbox but to kind of wrap up this part uh, the sandbox is kind of like minecraft on blockchain so everything that i described and if you're interested or again if you have kids that are interested in this like go to sandbox and then log in it says, you know, enter the metaverse because inside Sandbox, you have an avatar and you're able to visit all of these worlds. You're able to take part in concerts. You're able to visit celebrities location, go to museums and so on and so forth. And all of that is enabled by blockchain. So uh, this is, if you want to do more research, you know, this is the place to go. So now, that we've talked about kind of the exciting thing, if we go a little bit more down into detail, okay, but what the F is it? Like, what is it that enables this distributed ownership? So if I have to, oh yeah, so first, before I explain it, I'll let you know that crypto is dead. Uh, blockchain sucks. It's Web3 now. 
Right? So if, if, if you hear anybody saying anything else in Web3, they don't know what they're talking about. So big, big flag. This is tongue in cheek. This is ironic, okay? I say crypto is dead because over the past five to 10 years, events have happened and I feel like crypto has become a bad word. Uh, I see it myself when I go and meet new people. What do you do? I work in crypto. Gets a very different feedback from I have a Web3 agency. Because crypto, that word is associated with scams, with day trading, with certain things. That At least that's how I feel. This is very personal feeling. Huh? Um, but so I don't say I'm in crypto anymore. Moreover, crypto is one application of blockchain. I think everybody should, sh I feel like everybody would know that on the call. A blockchain is the underlying technology. And then crypto is one application of that technology. It's leveraging blockchain to send digital money, digital assets. Just like email is one application of the internet. You need to use the internet to send an email, but you can use the internet to do so many more things, to order a Uber or to order food or to visit Wikipedia, right? So similarly, crypto is just one application of blockchain. And why do I say that blockchain sucks? And also, I feel that the word has a very technical connotation. It instantly takes you to the detail of the chain. Why is it a chain? Because the data is connected in a chain-like structure. When I tell people I'm in blockchain, unless they also in blockchain, they tell me what chain? And so that's not the kind of good marketing way to present something, right? You want the information to flow freely and directly. So I feel that over the past two years, Web3, that word, has rightfully so kind of, it's kind of become an umbrella term for everything crypto, everything blockchain, everything next gen, everything metaverse. So at first I really didn't like the term. I felt like it was another gimmicky word. It's like, oh, crypto is over now, so we need to find a new word to describe it. But actually looking back, I think it is a very a good term, uh, notably because of that kind of logic I explained before, the read, read and write, read and write and own. That makes a lot of sense to me. So again, this slide is ironic. Crypto is definitely not dead. Blockchain is amazing. It's the basis for everything that I do professionally. Um, and it's beautifully summarized in the Web3 word uh, now. And I feel, again, like over the past two years, Web3, that word has become a lot more common uh, in everyday vocabulary. So to a five-year-old, blockchain is a way to keep knowledge. That's it. You don't need to look any further or make it more complicated. It's a way to store data. That's it. So then a five-year-old could say, why not keep it in a database? If it's a very passionate five-year-old, they'll say, okay, then I just keep it in a, in a book under my pillow. Uh, okay, yeah, you can do that. You can also store data in a book, in a central book, in a central ledger under your pillow or in a bank. However, and this is if I'm talking to a 15-year-old, it's a way to store data that is decentralized, transparent, and secure. So unlike the book under the pillow or the ledger in the bank is decentralized, which means that there is no unique central repository for one source of information. The I'll make a generalization. I'll, I'll, I'll say something that doesn't really make sense, but all the accounts and all the ledgers from a bank and say DBS. They are all hosted in the DBS office. And maybe they have multiple offices around the world that each have the data, but it's still DBS. And it's still centralized in one unit. Blockchain is decentralized, which means that anybody can join the network, have access to all the data, and host it, see it, read it, participate. And it is not limited to how many people are part of the current community. 
if you discover Bitcoin tomorrow and you become very passionate and you say, okay, I want to host a node, I want to be one of those points in the decentralized network, you can do that. People have been doing that since 2009 and they're still doing it today. You can join tomorrow and join the thing. So it's decentralized, which makes it a lot more resilient. Even if you destroy half or 99.9% .9 of all the nodes, it will come back. As long as there is one node, one or two nodes up, it will come back to more than before. It's unkillable unless you kill 100% of everything. Uh, it's transparent because everything is open. That's the way the code is designed. You can go and see any transaction. You can follow the flow of money from anywhere to anywhere since the beginning of the chain, since 2009. You can go back to the very first Bitcoin transaction 14 years ago and see it in a transparent record online. Uh, and it's secure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this could be like an entire other presentation. But the way the blocks are connected to each other is cryptographic. It's based on math and encryption and cryptography. It's very hard to hack. Um, also because a simple way to put it is that it requires, if it, if it were to be hacked, it would require an amount of computing power that is 10 times or a thousand times more than what the entire world has without going into details, but it's basically not hackable. Now, finally, to an adult, I would kind of make it a little bit more abstract. And I've touched on this before. It is a code-based, community-led, consensus governing system. So code-based, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you know, like a computer is very good at doing the thing that you tell it to do. If you code a program and it fails, it's most likely because you made an error coding the program. Like the computer does what you tell it to do. So if the code is correct, it cannot go wrong, right? So it's, it's code-based, community-led. This I mentioned earlier, the community self-organizes. If you think back on the World of Warcraft, the guilds, the societies and everything. So it's community-led and consensus governing system because the way it is secured and operated is consensus based. Inside the cryptographic elements of securing the system, you have you need to have consensus in order for the chain to go on. All the nodes, everybody needs to agree, this is the truth. Once all the nodes agree, this is the truth, then you move on to the next block. And you agree, everybody agrees again on this, and you move on to the next block and so on and so forth. So again, without going into the technical details, but it is consensus based. It's a, it's a governing system. Maybe you also have how, heard of a DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It is a governing system where everybody has a vote. Everything is ruled by code and everybody can participate. Maybe I'll pause here if there's a question or you want me to do the whole presentation? Uh, yeah, perhaps you go ahead. I'm looking at the time. We might need to speed up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> okay. So we, I'm too so passionate. Have, no, that, that, that's great. I mean, I'm as I said, I'm a 1, 1. 1.5 and this is great for me. <laughs> so why some people hate it? Let's look at the, the hater profile. Uh, the UI UX isn't there yet. Uh, if you download a crypto wallet, you have to save your seed phrase, which is what I mentioned at the very beginning. It's a list of words that don't make sense. I was befumbled when uh, I had to do this the first time. I just didn't, didn't get it. It's not convenient. Like, why do I have to do this? So there are some issues around the UI UX. Once you do get in it, again, the, the interfaces are not as simple as what we're used to in Web2. Uh, the loading times, the quote unquote loading times or the wait times you have to go through at different parts of the process are also a little confusing sometimes. Sometimes you have to wait for something. You think it's going to be instantaneous, but you have to wait sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. It's a, it's a, it varies because of the nature of the system. So that can also be quite scary. And most importantly, there are few recovery systems. So you must have heard stories of people losing their assets 
because it wasn't designed with social recovery in mind. It wasn't designed with safety in mind because in order to have safety, you need to have a central authority to override your mistake and to give you your money back. If you send money from the bank to another bank and you make a mistake, you can go to the bank and say, hey, help me like bring it back. They're gonna be unhappy, but they're gonna do it. In crypto, you can't because it's designed with personal, well, self-custody in mind and self-ownership. So this is not fine because you know if you make a mistake, there's no going back and we're not gonna get mass adoption if you know we have such risky procedures. Uh, also, there's been a lack of regulation and oversight, which doesn't help the mainstream to get on board. I think some people are a little sour also, you know, uh, I think for some people it's a missed opportunity. Um, and sometimes when you don't understand something, it's hard to get over the hump and make an effort. And yeah, I think some people hate it because they missed out. You know, I, I don't want to be a hater myself, but I think there's a little bit of that. I also definitely think there are some entrenched uh, interests. I'm not going to develop on that. Uh, there are some lobbying groups. This is known just like any industry, you know, so if you listen to certain sources of information, well, they're going to convince you that uh, crypto is bad and blockchain sucks for real because that's what they do. Um, there has been market manipulation, market manipulation, which is obviously not acceptable, uh, but it's also part of the growing pains, I think, of any industry, specifically when looking at fintech. So those are some of the reasons that uh, people might hate uh, on, on crypto. Uh, if we're looking at like who, and uh, maybe I'll skip this, this is like if you wanna do more research, but you got some people that are uh, either very famous for being against uh, crypto, and I guess they have their own reasons for that, uh, some people also change their position uh, very swiftly. Um, and very recently, we've seen quite a lot of that. You know, people that four years ago were very supportive, who now aren't. So these samples and these articles, I'm just putting out there to highlight how there are different sides to the story. And then there are different forces at play behind what is said, you know. So quick shameless plug. Uh, I'm CEO of uh, Portkey, which is a social recovery wallet, which means that you log in with your Google accounts or your email or your phone number. There is no seed phrase. So this shouldn't come as a surprise. I was very upset eight, eight years ago when I didn't understand the whole seed phrase thing. Well, now you have solutions such as Portkey that make it uh, completely seamless. So you can log in with your Google accounts. You can have a crypto wallet on chain but you don't have to deal with any of the complexity uh, of the chain. So we mostly work with uh, businesses. We're a B2B2C model, and we help mostly, as I mentioned, game studios migrate from Web2 to Web3. Um, so I'm very excited about this because, again, it's kind of like if I had this eight years ago, then I would have onboarded the ecosystem much faster. Um, in the future, everything's going to be easier. Um, if you dead man switch, for example, if you lose your wallet today, you're, it's over. In the future, we're going to be able, thanks to a technology like port keys, um, you're going to be able to put a dead man switch. So if the person cannot access the wallet for a year or however long of time, then ownership can be automatically transferred to someone else. The contracts can be upgraded over time, which is not possible today. This is a little technical. This is a little technical these things will make the experience a lot more seamless uh, than today, where it's still, you got a lot of uh, hurdles to go through. So if you're interested in this, we can talk more. I'm going to skip this. Um, I talked a lot about games, but as I mentioned in the beginning, you can apply this to anything. Cross-border payments, I can send money to somebody in Colombia, and it's going to take 10 minutes. Uh, smart contracts and DAOs, the self-governing organizations, I mentioned this, digital identity. You've got some countries that are looking at rolling out a national program for digital identity. All your work history, the diploma, all your credentials, everything on an open, transparent ledger system, uh, which I think would be great. And also in order to curb um, scam and, and you know other nefarious uh, activities, and you have an open record of everybody's identity and then supply chain and traceability when company says okay this comes from an organic farm well how do i really know right well if you implement blockchain correctly 
you have at least the technical system to prove that the data is correct. Uh, finally, don't read this slide, okay? This is a schematic of the IP licensing setup specifically for music. Okay? So if you're an artist today and you want to publish a record, basically you have to go through something like this. And again, don't read it. It's, it's, it's horrendous. With blockchain, I can be a single artist. I go on NFT platform. I put my music up and somebody buys it and it's done. Like it, it removes everything. It's directly from artist to consumer. If you want to take it further, um, just go back to the basic, read the um, white paper, the first document ever that was published about Bitcoin. Uh, it's only nine pages long. There is some math in it. Okay, so at some point it does get a little bit technical. It's fine, just like don't read the math. But if you want to start somewhere, just read the Bitcoin white paper. I think you would be amazed at how many people today are in crypto and you know, chance crypto and they haven't read the Bitcoin white paper, which is the, the basics, uh, you know? It, so if you wanna start somewhere, you can't go wrong starting with the white paper. Uh, some people say that uh, if the inventor of blockchain is God, then Andrea Santonopoulos is the Messiah because this guy has been actively educating, promoting the technology for more than 10 years, I guess. Again, I don't know him. I don't have uh, shares in his activities or whatever, but I started by reading The Internet of Money, which is amazing. It's very layman's term. It's it's perfect to start. And then on YouTube, Altcoin Daily is also a great, great channel um, that I often check out. Same thing. I'm not affiliated. These are just good sources of information. Uh, that's it. If you want to try blockchain, you can scan the QR code. It'll take you to the first game that we have on the port key uh, wallet. You can give it a try. You can register with your Gmail uh, accounts and you can play inside the, the little game and you can see uh, what it's like for yourself. Thank you. Crystal clear. That's great. Um, we have a few minutes uh, for uh, for questions. Uh, I will leave, uh, leave the, uh, the audience uh, ask question uh, first, considering that we don't have uh, much time. I have one question, um, Flo, you, you, you were saying that the UI UX is not there yet. Why is it so after so many years, it's like more than 10 years that crypto exists and the blockchain exists, why still the UI UX is uh, missing? Yeah, good question. So before I answer, I'll let you know that personally, I believe that this year, well, 23, 24, we're definitely at the tipping point for that. Obviously, I'm biased because this is my, my project. But when I go to conferences, when I talk to people, you see a lot of energy being put in that direction. So I think that if you ask me the same question a year from now, well, you won't ask me the same question a year from now, or at least that's what I believe and hope for, because I think we're at the tipping point. Now, to actually answer your question, I believe that it's because the ethos of the technology um, wasn't to do that. The technology was created by cryptographers, like the, the, the cyberpunks and people from the 70s and the 80s who had very, very strong philosophy and ethos around liberty, ownership rights, and so on and so forth. And so the, the, the several first waves of the technology, including Bitcoin, including Ethereum, were built with that in mind. They weren't built for everybody. They wasn't built with mainstream in mind. It was built with self-custody in mind. It was built kind of by developers for developers. Again, I want to pick, I want to put a big quotation mark around that. But at least that's that's how I feel. It, it, it wasn't made to be mainstream. It was made to solve a more fundamental, almost philosophical purpose. And so from that angle, well, it doesn't really matter if the UI UX is bad. Like if you really believe in something, then you're going to learn about it and you're going to figure it out. And then kind of you'll be worthy 
to benefit from the technology, right? Um, that's what, at least that's what I believe. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks. And also because there's a lot of stuff to build. Um, yeah, it's been 13 years already, 14 years, but there's so much innovation that has happened until then. So maybe it wasn't ready until now. Like there's there's a lot of stuff that was built before this. Uh, things also take time. So you might say, okay, 14 years is a lot to add Google login, right? Well, actually it's bleeding edge technology. Like it sounds simple. That's the whole goal, right? Replace the seed phrase with a Google account. It sounds very simple. In actuality, it is so complicated. Uh, and I, I think I can say so without too much ego because I work with my colleagues every day and the stuff we're building is quite bleeding edge. So what I'm trying to say is that we probably needed a lot more of these bricks to be built first so that we could reach that kind of development as well. Okay. Do we have a last question? Don't be shy, I don't bite, especially not on Zoom calls. <laughs> so I'll have a, if, if the answer can be quick, I'm sure the, that's not the, the right question for that, but if we look at crypto and banks, uh, you know, whether people dream of it or, or fear it, uh, there's kind of, oh, crypto is gonna take over and or should be taking over, it will be much better or it will. Um, the reality seems to be quite different. It doesn't seem as, as far as I understand possible for crypto to take over some of the services of functional latency that the banks are are, are, are taking. What are those? I mean, what what, what are the, the main, well, what's the future with, between, with the banks uh, uh, when we speak about crypto? It's a very difficult question, and I think it's the kind of question that is very personal. You ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different uh, answers, especially based on what they are a maximalist of. If you ask a Bitcoin maximalist, they might say banks are dead, mm -hmm. are going to die. Well, I know I don't think so. I think we'll still have banks. So the only thing I can answer to your question and also keeping it short, it's going to merge. I think it's going to merge. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will stay in the hardcore blockchain with the ethos, the philosophy, and they'll never use anything that has any form of centralization. At the opposite extreme, banks will integrate a little bit more decentralization, or at least they'll offer an ETF. Like it's been the talk, all of the, all of, everybody's talking about the ETF, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF validation in the US, right? So they'll, they'll make a little way, they'll embed a little bit of crypto. And you're going to have a whole spectrum. You're going to have people who are all the way centralized, people who are all the way decentralized. And in the middle, you'll have bold, centralized companies taking the risk to go more decentralized, decentralized projects realizing the need for centralization. And it's going to be kind of a, a merger at different stages of the uh, scale. So we're still in the learning process. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, well, well, we'll need to, to to go with the extremes and find our our own balance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just as a closing remark, then, and and after that, I promise I'm done. It's what I mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation. It's that I've rarely seen a space where there is so much to learn all the time and so much innovation. There's good. There's bad. You know, of course, but it just never stops. I, I learn something new literally every week. Um, and I think that's quite exciting. Uh, so my, I have, a, I don't have a questions actually, but I just want to know like your views on that. Like why the nations, why the economies are feeling threatened because of cryptos, blockchains and everything and why they are stopping this. Like have, you have already shown in your presentation, there are people who are against it. So it's not actually a question. It's like, just wanted to know about from the experts view that what, that what is they feel threatened about? I think generally, thank you for the question. I think generally speaking, people are scared of change, change. And there are entrenched interests. Like why change something if it's been working for the past 200 years? You know, um, wealth compounds over time as well, right? So it's funny because, I mean, it's interesting because you talk about nations. So some nations are staunchly opposed probably because they have entrenched interests. 
some nations are embracing the technology like so much, like uh, El Salvador and Singapore, uh, Dubai, UAE, I mean, and, and more. And you know, not to trash talk the US or Europe, or but uh, some countries are embracing it 100% because they see the opportunity and maybe they don't have entrenched interests or a historical background that would make it less valuable to them to embrace that technology. Um, so in just one word, I think it's related to each country's history. Uh, different countries have different societies and set up and different histories. They come from different places. So they're going to react differently to something that is very new. Um, and that is a big change from what anybody has seen before. I hope that answers your, your question. Definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Florian. That was very, uh, very interesting, very insightful, um, and very clearly explained. Uh, so fantastic to everybody else. So you can find uh, the link to join the French Tech if you haven't done so yet. And otherwise, we uh, host uh, those uh, Lunch and Learn uh, series twice a month. So keep posted, uh, more to come uh, in November. Thank Thanks you so much. everyone. Bye. Thank you for all y'all. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.